Hi, everybody. Welcome to this edition of The Agronomist. I'm Z Smith. And for some reason, we're having a bit of a technology glitch and I uh, can't see some of you. So uh, as always, but especially right now, give us a shout out. Uh, let us know you're there. Say hello. Say good evening. Um, and uh, I see John is here. And thank you, John, for opening up the show as always. So, uh, so wonderful. But make sure you get your comments in there. Ask your questions. Ask early. Ask often. Um, make sure you get your question in there tonight because that's what this show is all about. Um, I should mention, of course, that for watching, you have exactly four weeks to let us know that you've watched this episode to qualify for your CEU credit. So make sure you head over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists to let us know uh, that you've watched this episode and get those uh, CEU credits. All right. So tonight uh, it is May 3rd. It is early May. We are talking planting and seeding specifically. We're going to talk about how to do the best job possible in the conditions you've got and with a keen eye on planting and seeding depth across across a whole bunch of crops. So uh, to bring in my guest tonight, I've got Mike Hillhorst of Federated Cooperatives Limited. And uh, some of you may know Peter Wheat Pete Johnson, resident agronomist with Real Agriculture. Welcome here, Mike and Wheat Pete. Hey, Lindsay, how are you? I'm doing well. Mike, how are you? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. All right. Okay, Mike, you're uh, in Southern Alberta. Yes. Central Alberta, Southeast Edmonton. Oh, there you go. My bad. And um, so does that mean that you're immune to the gale force winds that Southern Alberta has all the time? Well, we seem to get them at about three quarters speed, but uh, yeah, it can get fairly windy here. That's for sure. Yep. Okay. All right. Yes. And, and Pete, of course, is in God's country. Right, Pete? Absolutely. Southwestern Ontario with a banana belt of Canada. Couldn't get much better than this, baby. Crappy there rainy no... day today. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was going to say we're having the same. But if we could send the rain over that away to where Mike is, I think everybody would be a lot happier. Um, but of course, that does bring us to our topic for tonight. Um, that That is seeding and planting, depending on which crop we're talking about and which region we're in, um, and doing the best job possible. Um, also, shout out to Wheat Pete. Congratulations on being a grandpa again. Kara says. Yep. This is number seven, Absolutely. I think. Number mm -hmm. seven. So, uh, yep. So yeah, very lucky cool. number seven. Congrats. Um and uh and Jay is and, and Ray is here, so thank you for that. Okay, so now we know that some things are working. I'm missing a few little screens here, but that's okay. All right, let's get rolling. Uh, starting with um and thank you to both of you, actually. I should I should shout out to both of you for sending in topics and things you wanted to cover. That was well <laughs> done. Yeah, I'm pretty impressed. Well, the last time you said that 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 I kind of took over from you, Lindsay, and so I thought this time I'd give you the questions and it wouldn't look like I took over, even though I really did take over. Right. Yeah, totally. Also, I did, ask, <laughs> I did full disclosure, ask him to fax them. And he made the sound. He wrote out what it would sound like to still fax things. Um, so I do appreciate that as well. Okay, so I want to start. Uh, I do want to start in, with cereals because, of course, we have wheat, peat, and Mike. Of course, in the West, this is the one crop that we can all agree on, right? Everyone has the exact same opinion of how all cereals should be seeded, at what depth and what rate, right? Totally in agreement, or no? We shall. <laughs> All right, Mike, let's start with you um, now. Much of the prairies in a bit of a dry bias and in some place an extreme drought. Um, where where are we at with, are we chasing moisture still with cereals? Are we sticking to our ideal? What's, what's happening there? Yeah, I think in central and southern prairies, we're certainly starting to chase the moisture. I know, you know, from, say, from Edmonton north, it's still, you know, fairly wet. It has been wet for years, so... You know, I think the topsoil is drying out a little bit, but, uh, you know, to be honest with you, north of Edmonton and the Peace Country uh, last Friday, we're, we're sick, had four to six inches of snow. So I don't think they're um, you know, wanting any more rain for the next little while, but certainly when you get down to Calgary and down to Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, and then east in the prairies, you know, it's, it's pretty dry. Planting's going on right now, and it's, uh, it's, it's never an easy decision to know, you know, how, how far to chase that moisture. All right. And Pete, you have the magic number, right? For our winter well, wheat have... in the fall in Ontario. What's the magic number? Yeah. Well, the magic, so the magic number always starts with get to moisture. Uh, 
because if you don't get to moisture, then that can be all bad. And, and Mike and I should have a great conversation about how deep can you go before you say it's too deep, because that is, it, I mean, gosh, Mike, if they're chasing moisture already with cereals, they didn't start early enough. Like, dang it, get out there earlier and cereals take the cold. You just want to go when there's moisture there and get the hard stuff in the ground. But winter wheat in the fall, you know, we really, in a perfect world, we would target one inch. It's not a perfect world. And I get more problems from planting too shallow than I do from too deep when I look at, at problems in the spring. And it's we, we have to get at least an inch deep to get our roots as deep as possible because the crown always sets about three quarters of an inch in the ground. So if we seed it half an inch, then the roots that hold the plant in the ground, they're not deep enough. So we target an inch, but realistically we end up planting in a quarter, inch and a half to make sure that almost all the seeds are at least that inch deep in the soil. And, and we can get that well-rooted crop that really hangs in and doesn't have problems from a frost heat. Uh, unless, as I said, and we get this occasionally, we've had falls where it actually got too high and we have planted wheat, winter wheat in the fall on heavy clay soil, Essex clay. It's it, like, it is not nice dirt, three inches deep to find moisture. And the, the neighbor planted in an inch into dust. Ours um, it took 12 days to emerge. It was mighty slowing up for a wheat crop but their crop didn't emerge for 40 days because we didn't get rain for almost a month. And, and the crop seeded into moisture was just that much better. So now Mike, in, a, in, a, in an area where you're perhaps not wanting extra moisture, of course we go into less than ideal conditions as well, but would you also, for spring cereals then, are you targeting that one inch, inch and a quarter? Yeah, I think a lot of times it's a, maybe a little deeper out here, maybe an inch and a half to two inches, you know, it's kind of the norm, you know, going down to three inches is, is pretty terrifying. And, and it happens every year, you know, depending on, on certain factors, you know, speed and, and everything else, worn out shanks, who knows, right? It could be, uh, could be a lot of different things, but those plants, they have a heck of a time going on and, you know, and, and emerging. And, you know, if, if you're in at that inch and a half, maybe two inches, I mean, when you do finally get those rains, you know, any significant rains after seeding, then there's not that much or not as much distance for that moisture to meet, so to speak. So I think that's always a, you know, always a good thing too. And I mean, if the, if the moisture's down at an inch, plant it an inch because that wheat's going to get up that much quicker, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So now, according to Wheat Pete, everyone should have been out in January this year, I guess, for most <laughs> of Southern Alberta. So there is a limit. Okay. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's, now, it's yeah. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's it's pretty interesting because I'm sure there's a limit, but it, it's pretty early that limit. If you look at the data coming out of Alberta, it's it is quite early, and and I think Mike hit on one thing that's really quite critical is that it's it's not like seeding date is one thing, and you want to push seeding dates early on cereals, in my opinion, but it's the plant. It's really about the day it emerges that kind of sets when it's going to mature. So Mike's right. Yeah. When you can seed at an inch with a spring cereal, because the spring cereal doesn't need to anchor itself in the ground, you as the same way that winter wheat does over, over the winter period. So at an inch there, man, and it, it takes 50 growing degree days for every inch of depth. And so if you can seed at an inch into good moisture, it's going to be up maybe five days earlier and that means it'll head five days earlier or four days earlier and that means a longer grain fill period so you go as shallow as you can to that inch level when you have excellent moisture because you're just going to get more yield yeah i mean in northern central alberta or you know in, in all the northern fridges of the prairies i mean that's one thing that we always battle is, is maturity and and not fighting that crop hopefully in October to get it off, you know, and then, you know, we talk about fertility and all these other things that can, that can impact that. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the quicker you can get out of the ground. I mean, even when we're talking about seed treatments, I mean, the seed treatment's going to be that much more robust. It's going to be, you know, still doing its job as that plant emerges, where if it's three inches down for wheat or, you know, two inches down for canola, man, that thing's, that thing's struggling and it's pretty much uh, used up all its reserves that it can. And that seed treatment's yeah. basically gone by the time it hits the 
the flea beetle barrage that it hits once it gets up in in this right. country anyway when, with canola anyway. I, I sort of feel like canola seeded at two inches or or less or more I feel like it's like if you were drowning and when you finally reach the surface, then then someone splashes water in your face. It's like the flea beetles that jump at you as soon as you get through. Yeah, poor little things. Anyway, we can talk about canola in a second, but I did want to share Jason's in the in the comments here. So hi, Jason. Um, good to see you again. Talking about um, he's in southern Manitoba, an incredibly dry region right now, but they did get three tenths of an inch um, of rain in south central Manitoba, but you wouldn't even know it. It is that dry. Um, and he says the oats and wheat were seeded at one and a half to two inches already. We have heard reports of the very early stuff that went in did come up and has run out of moisture. So that is wheat peat. When we talk about early seeding, spring cereals, that is in an incredibly dry situation. That is one of the risks. Right, that if it had enough moisture to germinate, but that's it, then what? Yeah, so so typically you would hope that you're not going to to run out of moisture if you seed on the first of April. Uh, I, I mean, that essentially that you have moisture in the top three inches and nothing underneath that. And if that's the case, I don't know. I don't. I don't think you can win in that scenario. I think you're really behind the eight ball. And, and you seed early to make use of that top three inches of moisture because otherwise the winds will blow just as, as uh, Mike talked about and take that moisture away. And, and then you've got no moisture to seed into. So that, that's a whole different kind of scenario. But mostly you would hope you have enough moisture that the plant can continue to chase it down. And if that's mm -hmm. not the case, you, yeah, I don't know. I don't think there is a good answer if, if that's not the case. So we're going to go to canola for a bit and then we'll go to our big fat seeded corn and soybean stuff, the big, the big powerhouses, but that are kind of also princesses. Anyway, corn. But let's talk about canola a little bit, Mike, because of course, you know, canola being that teeny little seed, um, typically we don't want to put it all that deep in the ground. Um, but if it's dry, that's a concern. But of course, if it's wet, we also, I mean, we have seen instances, I know I'm from Southern Manitoba, as are you. And I mean, we've seen it floated on with a little harrow over top and it makes a crop. So so what's our consideration there with, can with canola? Is there an ideal depth for canola? Well, I think really it's that, you know, half an inch to three quarters of an inch is probably ideal. You know, one inch I can probably live with. And, um, you know, most of the time it'll, it'll turn out pretty well. I think when you're seeding and you're out there checking your drill, I mean, there's, there's the odd time, honestly, you probably want to see the odd seed on top of the ground. Uh, but that may indicate some seed bouncing and maybe some, you know, air velocity issues that you might want to check and, and things like that. But yeah, I don't think much more than an inch uh, I'm comfortable with, but I mean, you know, every year <clears throat> in this one video we'll probably look at today, we'll, we'll describe it. I mean, seeding speed and how you can get to two inches pretty quick. When you start uh, getting uh, too aggressive on the happy handle there in the tractor, it can uh, it can really cause some issues with your canola emergence. And I mean, when those little canola plants have to come up from two inches, I mean, sometimes they just don't make it, right? You see a lot of seedling blight and damping off. You find the you know the the blue shells of the canola seed, and that's all you find. You wonder, well, what happened here? Well, it damped off. You know, it just mm -hmm. especially especially early on, like I've. You know, lots of guys will try and, and seed, you know, what I think is quite early, like maybe even right now or last week. And, and then their last seeded canola field will be seeded and then the, you know, the 15th of May and the soil temperature is 10 or 15 degrees. And then that last seeded field will catch up to the first. So sometimes, it, you know, you just got to wonder and, um, you know, and, and really think about uh, the, the year and, and what you're trying to accomplish. But I mean, it's pushing it too hard especially with a canola crop and a lot of our crops we're putting 300 350 dollars an acre into the ground we've got to do our best job possible and sometimes with canola i find it's just as simple as slowing down a little bit even a quarter half a mile an hour can make a big difference so yeah absolutely and and you know what with that let's go to our first clip uh it's it's clip number three jay um this is uh this is a fun one because this might be the first one that i filmed and so I would like everyone to watch this video and realize this is why I do the talking and not the filming. Okay, so apologies for the videography work. Um, but we're going to go to clip three. This is with uh, Kristen Phillips, who who was with Canola Council at the time. And we're going to look at the difference between three miles an hour and five miles an hour um, seeding speed on canola. Yeah. 
Okay, so uh, we often talk about as you increase your speed, you're gonna get more bounce and you're gonna get different seating depths within um, a seat of row. So what we're gonna do is compare the three miles an hour, uh, which is on this side, to the five miles an hour on this side and see what we find. Okay. So again, we, we dug up the foot of row and then we're checking the depth here. And so this one was the three miles an hour. And you can see here that we range in depth from a half inch seating depth to the longest being about an inch and a quarter um, on 10 plants. That was what was in that foot of row. And then when we go over to the other side, um, which was sown at five miles an hour with the same drill, um, we have 13 plants and we range anywhere from one inch seating depth up to about two and a quarter inches of seeding depth. So a lot more variability here with a lot more of the seeds being, you know, 10 of them being uh, deeper than they were supposed to be. And really, is this what you expected to see? Yeah, the faster, the faster you're moving that drill across the, the field, uh, the more variability you're gonna have. And so that's kind of where we, you know, make that recommendation of if you're gonna go a, uh, you know, a half a mile faster, you might want to go another half a pound per acre of seed so that you decrease that variability. And where does variability really come in to play as far as, is it an issue with crop staging? Is it an issue with, um, say, harvest management? Where does it really play a role? The biggest thing is putting the energy into the plant, right? This plant's had to put a lot more energy to push this out of the ground compared to something like this. So it's already using energy and reserves that it doesn't need to use. Um, and then, yeah, obviously crop staging, it's going to emerge at different times the deeper it has to come from. So, sorry about that, anyone who got motion sickness, but uh, hey, those were the days in the field with the handicap. Okay, but but a really good visual, um, and I really love the Canola Council has done this a couple times where they, they do this, they pull out a foot of row um, at that very early seedling stage and, and do a full comparison of, of what those plants look like at different at different speeds and it's a great visual to see you know just that couple miles an hour difference can significantly impact your emergence and and how even that is mike yeah, i'll go to you really oh go ahead yeah no, I, I think yeah, it really depends really depends on the you know on, on the drill that you have on the farm too obviously you know what kind of openers you have uh, you know in regards to how fast you can seed there's no question there's differences between you know um you know, framed units versus, uh, you know, individual row units between, um, you know, uh, planters, all those kinds of things, you know, what what kind of yield or uh, field preparation went on beforehand, all those kind of things. Trash management is a big one with canola. You know, how was that handled last weed in your 80 or 90 bushel hard red crop? Um, all these types of things. So, I mean, uh, where uh, openers can wear out, you know, sometimes even with a, you know, a, a a, a double a double disc drill or a, sorry a um, a stealth type opener that you have the two seed rows coming out in the and the fertilizer down below sometimes you know they wear out and I find that seed trench kind of collapses and a lot of times with canola that canola seed can fall down into that one and a half two inch fertilizer band and can burn it and it it totally kills it but uh, you know some of those things can happen depending on you know soil texture and, and speed as well sometimes you get far too much dirt flowing over the uh, the wings of the opener. Uh, things like that when you get going too fast you may be at the ideal um, depth setting but because you're going so fast you're throwing that extra dirt over top and it's and it's just burying the seeds so a few things to think about mm -hmm. now yeah, Pete, got I, yeah okay hang on before before we jump in here <laughs> i want i'm gonna throw you a curveball because i can <laughs> And so, but Mike alluded to it. It was one of the questions I had is that obviously we have our, you know, targeted depths, but what role does soil texture have on achieving that as far as how we need to be setting our drills or our planters and, and what role that soil texture plays? Yeah. So I think soil texture is a huge player, particularly if you get a rain after you seed. Now, if it's super dry and you never get a rain and the opener opens it up, then it doesn't make much difference because it opened the clay up, it opened the sand up, and, and there's not really any, any tight soil over top. But man, you get down in Lambton County into that tough clay in that part of the world and 
automatically they up their seating rates by at least 25% because they know they're going to have that much more mortality when they seed. It's just, it's just part of the drill. They just know they have that tough a soil. The other thing though, Lindsay, that like three mile an hour and five mile an hour, like how do you guys get anything done? Nobody in Ontario seeds under five mile an hour. It's from five and up, baby. Like, <laughs> I think, what did you call well, it? Sorry, the happy Mike, handle. Yeah, the happy can... handle. Yeah. <laughs> but I think you have, to, Pete, you have to remember though, Western Canadian farmers are doing everything at once. They're putting all the fertilizer down. They're putting all the seed down. They're doing a way better job. These aren't spill drills. So I'm oh, just yes, saying. They are. There's, no, they're spill <laughs> drills. No, they, are, they are all spill drills. Oh, it's just, this isn't anyway, fair. Now they, I'm they, they are you. putting Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no. They, they, they are definitely putting on more nitrogen. There's lots yeah. of guys in Ontario with the, with the seed drill, right? So with the cedar mm -hmm. that are putting on the majority of the phosphorus and maybe some potash. So we're, we've got guys that are doing quite a bit from that standpoint as well. But I think the other, the other thing, and I was really interested because in that clip, uh, Kristen had 13 plants where she had it seeded deep and only 10 plants where she had it seeded shallow. And, and so that just shows you that that even the delivery system isn't being uniform in how in terms of how many seeds that that you're getting in that foot of row, and and we just have to get better with seeders. And I don't care if it's a hoe drill. And by the way, that I think that was a 2013 clip, something like that, mm -hmm. Lindsay, if I recall yeah. correctly. And even hoe drills, the new hoe drills are much better at depth control than they were 10 years ago. We have parallel linkage, we're running, we're running uh, depth gauge wheels. If you go back 10 years, they basically set the depth on the, on the wheels that carried the entire unit. Well, you can't get good depth when you do that. I, I, you can't get good depth with a hoe drill at the best of times, but at least they've stepped the game up quite a bit in comparison. And Mike mentioned for canola, and I, I think, Mike, there's been some really good work done by the Canola Council and some, some of the people in Manitoba looking at planters in 15-inch rows to seed mm -hmm. canola, and they just do such a better job that I, I really think I think that shows you with some crops, not, not all crops are as critical, but mm -hmm. canola crops, I think are pretty critical to get that depth right. And, and a planter where you're sensing that depth perfectly does just that much better job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree, Pete. I mean, you know, I probably the best canola emergence I've ever seen was a 15 inch Monison planter just north of my house a few years ago. And I tell you, it was unbelievable. And it was at about two pounds an acre, maybe 1.6. You know, we're generally we're seeding at, you know, three and a half to five and a half pounds. So, mm -hmm. you know, it it's just amazing. I mean, planters and I'm, I'm quite excited actually to see the uh, the smart seeder as well. You know, some of that mm -hmm. new technology. I mean, it's kind of a cross between, a you know, a, an air drill and a, and a planter. And some of the things that I think it can likely do down the road um, are going to be pretty fantastic. Because, I mean, you even you even talk about air distribution with air drills and and, you know, the velocities coming out of each shank across 60 feet, I mean, they're all over the place. There's been a lot of research done, you know, by, by a few different independent agronomists. And I think maybe even Pammy's done some of that research. And I mean, the, the air velocity is all over the place. And then sometimes, you know, when we're putting 350, 400 pounds of, of uh, fertilizer down and trying to seed canola, and we only have one fan to control that airspeed, man, that canola gets quite a ride from the tank to the... <laughs> The, to the ground well, right i mean exactly they don't all make it right like if you actually oh. right if you actually go and you check you have a certain amount of mortality that's just happening from the ride from the tank to the ground right i mean well, sure, some right. of it yeah. split yeah so, i mean with canola yeah, no. with canola good mortality is 30 percent, and sometimes yeah. it's 50 or more. that yeah. seems kind of odd but the big part of it is is the equipment that we're using in, in some cases so mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, now, Jason has a point, and this actually, this does sort of dovetail in here that he'd say that Jason says, I'd say seed to soil contact trumps depth. Just going to throw that out there. And and someone else, of course, um, or Jason also noted the type of residue and size of the residue. So, of course, we are talking about seeding depth and planting depth. And realistically, 
what you have to get through to get to the seed where you want it also comes into play as well. And that's going to, that's going to come into play in, in now, most of us don't have a choice in what we use to seed or plant because we use what we have. But then we can, of course, potentially tweak our settings or maybe what we end up doing to the field before we head across it again. So I'm going to come back to some of that in a minute, but we do have two other clips to get to tonight at some point. So I figure we're going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to head out and over into soybean and corn territory. So we're going to go to this clip uh, with Horse Bonner. He's been doing some really interesting work about kind of finding that ideal uh, seeding depth sorry, planting depth for soybeans. Although in Western Canada, plenty of them get seeded. Anyway, so we're going to, we'll watch this video with uh, Horst and Burn and then uh, see what comes out of this discussion. Uh, you know, <clears throat> we don't know uh, what the spring will bring. It's looking good out there now. Um, but, uh, you know, it may snow, it may not, it may be dry, it may be wet. But what I do know is we have some research from last year and um, I want to dig into that and uh, you did you know both of those topics planting depth and and planting date um, you know given the conditions that we're going into this year let's look at your planting depth data and uh, I put it up on the screen right now and uh, you know in 2020 you planted at four depths and at three times during the spring and uh, you know we're looking at some stand count data here what did you learn so the, the, the key thing you always have to remember with soybeans is that you want enough moisture for them to really be able to germinate properly and then also emerge. So that's the challenge why we don't just go at half an inch or even quarter inch kind of thing. It's a, it's a moisture uh, availability issue, right? And so that's why some growers like to go a little bit deeper to make sure that they have the moisture. And so that's a starting point. So what did we learn? Well, the April 22nd date there, the seeding, the, the stand was the same for one inch and one and a half inches. And then at two inches, we had a little bit less. And at two and a half inches, it really dropped. So the learning from that one is, Bernard, that um, the, the story that we've heard sometimes is with very early planting, you should go deeper to try and minimize the amount of fluctuation in terms of temperature uh, because of air temperature changes so much, uh, that's not correct for soybeans. We want them to be relatively shallow so that they get as much heat from the sun as possible. So then as you get into May, you know, again, a similar kind of story. Uh, the, the plant stand didn't drop until we went to two inches or deeper. And then for the final date, of course, things are much warmer. So things are starting to dry out. And, uh, yeah, we could go two inches, no problem. And even two and a half inches really was fine. Uh, but we did start to lose some plants. Break. Let's add in some some yield here, um, Horst, and see uh, what that tells us here. Obviously, you've got some nice yields at those, at those uh, that, that one and one inch depth here. Yeah, that's right. And so the, the learning here, or let me put it this way, the surprise that I had is that the one inch did as well as the one and a half inches. Like it's, it's well known that uh, the kind of rule of thumb for soybeans is one and a half inches, and we've confirmed that here. But some growers say, you know, and no-till, planting early, um, I've got the moisture, let's go even shallower just to get them out of the ground fast. And this this data set here really supports that to some extent. Uh, the yield was the same for the one inch and the one and a half inch. The, 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 the trouble is, you know, if you run out of moisture at one inch, because it can dry up pretty quickly in, in that top, top layer of soil. So that's the part that scares us a little bit. But those numbers are compelling, right? If uh, we're going to do it again in 2021 here, and, and we'll see how it turns out. But, um, uh, you know, if we can pull that off year year after year, you, you, you may start to ask yourself, should we even be going uh, at an inch and a half? Maybe an inch and a quarter is, is uh, even better, right? Well, I'll have everyone know that during that um, darling video, this whole thing kicked me off. And for a moment there, I thought that Wheat Pete was going to have to be the host. But I'm back. And so, you know.
know, just sweating a little. It's fine. Okay, let's talk about soybeans. Um, Mike, just imagine these are like faba beans or peas, but uglier. Okay, so I'm just kidding. Faba beans are way uglier. Okay, so but we people start with you. Horace has done a lot of research, some really cool stuff. Was it surprising to you sort of how consistent those yields were given the different depths and planting dates? Yeah, actually, it was really cool stuff because they're, they're, we're talking about ultra early soybeans now as well. And lots mm -hmm. of this going on in the in the U.S. in particular and, and some large growers finding that they're getting big yield bumps by seeding earlier. And, and one of the things they talk about is exactly what Horace said. Don't seed shallow because if you seed shallow, the sun hits that soil surface and in the heat of the day, it warms up a lot and then it cools down more at night and you get these big temperature swings and that's a negative. And, and when we get to corn, we're going to talk about that, right, Lindsay? Because in corn, it's real. But in, in horse data under Ontario conditions, we just don't see that because, I mean, April 20th is quite early to seed soybeans in Ontario. And, and he's, you know, that's it's pushing it for sure. And the sweet spot is shallow, inch, inch and a half. And Horst is right. Beans, soybeans take a lot more moisture in order to germinate than a wheat seed does or a corn seed does. Soybeans need four times their weight in water, whereas a wheat seed typically only needs about its weight in water, or at the very most twice its weight in water, and it's a smaller seed, so it takes way less water. You seed too shallow and the winds blow and it dries out, that's, that's trouble. But as long as you have moisture there, man, seeding shallow works and it gets them out of the ground quicker. And, and it did surprise us. It sort of makes you think that that soybeans, as we say, they're just tough and they and they they don't seem to to suffer as much when they're when there's a little less uniformity there, or I don't know, they just compensate better uh, one way or another. But yeah, it, it surprised me for sure, but it's really cool data. So it it is very neat, and I'm I'm glad to see it sort of continuing as well um, this year and these sorts of things. I know that there has been similar work certainly out west on planting date of soybeans. I think more focused on you know just how late can it go in and still make a crop, um, which is still a concern. I mean, we've come a long way on short season varieties for sure, uh, but at the same time, I mean, it's still a significantly shorter growing season. So um, yeah, that's that's one of those ones that. My hat goes off to a lot of the Western growers who started with soybeans when they did, because that was that was pretty pioneering. Let's say there was that was that was a big gamble that some of those growers took. Yeah. So so Lindsay, I'd like to ask Mike. So when it comes to peas and lentils and you know uh, faba beans, if you like the the soybean like crops that you grow in Western Canada, what's your experience from a planting date with with those crops? Because the root system on those crops is different than than a grass crop, and I think that's part of what makes that planting depth difference as well. So, uh, any comments or or data that you're aware of? Well, I don't know. I can't uh, speak to a lot of data off the top of my head, but I but I know that generally speaking, if peas are in the rotation, they're very likely the first ones to be planted. And in a lot of cases, that means, you know, that third week of April, last week of April, in, in a lot of cases, and, you know, a comfortable depth for peas or faba beans is that two inches, maybe even three inches for faba beans. They're so big. Um, you know, they do have a lot of reserve. They can push through, you know, quite a bit. Um, they're fairly frost tolerant as peas are too. If we do get those, I mean, this morning at home, it was minus seven, right? So it's still pretty cold out there. But um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, if we can go to two inches, great. But I still, you know, it, it comes back to if there's moisture at one inch, why not seed them at an inch or inch and a half and let them come out, come out of the ground that much quicker? You know, it, like I say, we're always fighting maturity and days of maturity and, and that, uh, you know, end of season maturity. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, it can, it can mean the difference, uh, you know, between grade, between pulling your hair out, between, you know, combining when the Christmas carols are going in your combine. And, you know, we've seen that more than, more than I'd like to see in the last five or 10 years. So, you know, all those mm -hmm. things will, will go into helping the, you know, the peas get out of the ground and, and get rolling. So. Um, faba beans are a fascinating crop for sure. They're, they're, yeah. But again, not pretty. 
Like they're pretty when they're growing. Lara's going to get mad at me for this. They're a beautiful yeah. plant growing, but the seeds themselves are hideous. I'm just putting it out there. Okay. Um, I do have a question here from Jenneth. So uh, thanks for this, Jenneth. Um, you can hear her on my Agronomy Geeks podcast. I forget which episode number. Maybe remind me. Anyway, um, any information on moisture content of soy seed, soybean seed and effect on the time it takes for germination? That's an interesting question. What what is what's dry for soybeans, Pete? Yeah, so typically we consider thirteen percent moisture to be dry for soybeans, and uh, if you're at eight percent, the the really interesting part of that is that if you're at eight percent moisture, it'll take a little more moisture for sure for that soybean to get enough moisture in it to germinate. But what's even more critical is typically at when you get over dry soybeans in the handling process for cleaning and treating, you crack seed coats. And as soon as you crack seed coats, you've lost the vigor. The 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 solutes leak out of the seed and they attract all the, the bugs uh, into the soybean seed. And so a much bigger point of over dry soybean is seed quality and seed vigor than the actual amount of moisture that it would take up. And, and Jenneth, you're, you're absolutely right. It's going to take more moisture at 8% than it is at 13% or even 14 or 15%. But the, the total amount of moisture ends up being about four times the weight of the soybean seed. And so that amount of difference between eight and 13% in terms of total amount of moisture is is a relatively small percentage. I'd have to do the math to figure it out exactly. Uh, so it's a difference, but it, it's maybe not as big a difference as what you'd think. And and the greater difference for sure is seed quality. And and by the way, Lindsay, we haven't talked about that, but man, if, if you got to go deep, right? All of a sudden, there's other things that become really, really, really important. And I think Jason mentioned it as well, or, or maybe it was Ray mentioned, save the big seed for planting deep. And eh, well, there's some some yeses and nos maybe about that, but uh, it is it is really interesting that seed quality becomes really important when you go deeper. Well, Mike, yeah, you I mentioned, of course, the the disease pressure too, and the insect pressure, and the damping off, and the right, like how important is it to make sure you've got your seed your seed treated for what's at what's there, but also the longer it takes, the more susceptible it is. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, you know, a lot of the uh, the peas and the cereals, generally speaking, can be, you know, farm safe seed as well, which I have absolutely no problem with as long as you're doing, you know, good testing of that seed. And that just doesn't mean a germination test. That means vigor, that means disease screen, all those kind of things and, and get a thousand kernel weight. So you're, so you're targeting that plant stand and setting your drill at a proper rate as well. But I mean, it, it all starts with the seed. And I mean, you know, I've seen a lot of times where, you know, um, Producers have got a simple germination test and, you know, we test that same lot and we look at the vigor and vigor can be a really, can really sway from year to year, depending on how the harvest was with the seed yeah. production. And, you know, sometimes you can see vigors all of a sudden down to 50 to 60%. So really your, your actual live germination of that seed's probably going to be somewhere in between there. But to me, 60 or 70% germination is, is not acceptable whatsoever when I'm putting three or 400 bucks in the ground, like, we can't skimp out on seed. We've got to make sure that we're, you know, starting with good soldiers that are going to take us into battle and do well and win the fight against Mother Nature because she, be she can be a harsh gal sometimes. So it's, uh, you know, you got to think about that and seed treatment. You know, you hear a lot of uh, comments about, well, it's the middle of May, the soil's worm, don't need to treat our seed anymore. I don't know if I agree with that. The, the diseases are still there. Maybe a, a little different strain is going to uh, take on your seed than, than when it's cooler, but uh, they're all still there and they're probably more active than they were two weeks ago. So, you know, the warm of the seed is, or the warm of the soil is, the uh, the more activity you're going to have in the, uh, you know, in the microbial world and the fungal world. And they're just, they're just waiting to eat your seed coming out of the ground. So darn pests. Um, John has a question here. And Pete, I think this is in regards to the, the moisture content of the seed. Uh, so John's asking, is that true for wheat as well? And, and so I think that's along the lines of if you've got more, uh, if, you're, if your wheat seeds over dry or more dry, is it sort of the same idea? I, yeah, I would imagine sure. I mean, we're not as concerned for damage, but. Right. And, and so typically because wheat seed just by its very nature, has a much tougher pericarp. It's harder to, to break it apart. It's not impossible, by the way. But 
we it, and it's smaller. I mean, that's the other part of that. One of the most interesting things about soybean seed is that you would think that you know you want big seed because big seed it's got lots more seed reserves, food reserves there to to push that soybean out. But typically, the bigger the seed in the research, the bigger the seed, the more likely we've damaged the seed coat. Because in the combine process, that big seed is more likely to get hit by the, the cylinder or, or by the rotor. And, and we just end up with more damaged big seed than we do little seed. And so little soybean seed often has higher vigor than big soybean seed. The converse is if I plant the stuff four inches deep, the little soybean seed may well run out of food reserves before it ever makes it to the soil surface. So in general terms, big seed does have more energy reserve and you will get better emergence if you plant it deep. To answer John's question, with wheat, we typically don't see big ranges in vigor based on seed size or seed coat cracks. We see big differences in vigor between seed lots. There's absolutely big differences and there's also genetic differences. Even within wheat or so we talk lots about corn and the genetic differences in corn to their early cold emergence, but th those, those exist in soybeans and in, in cereals as well, for sure. Okay. I do want to, we haven't talked about corn and realistically we have done entire shows on corn and we probably still could, but I do want to at least hit on um, one of the most interesting things. And I think we did actually show this clip um, in one of our past episodes is, is this idea that for corn, Pete, you actually going deeper actually evens out emergence. And this blows my mind a little bit, although we're talking three inches, not like four or five, but walk me through this pro this thought process of going deeper for more even emergence in corn. Yeah. And so this is <laughs> like, this is just mind boggling. And, and what it really shows is that horse data shows that soybeans are different from corn in this particular case. And that's why I asked Mike, like, what about peas? What about faba beans? Are, are they more like corn where uniformity of emergence trumps everything else? And you wouldn't have thought that, but when corn plants emerge even, you know, one day different, we can get four, five, six percent less yield. And so where most crops, I think we the faster we get them to emerge, the better. With corn, it's actually we want them all up within 12 hours or 24 hours or as tight as a window as we can get that, even if they take two or three or five days longer to emerge, if they all come up at the same time, then we get higher yield. And so that's why when we plant deeper, as we go deeper, we get less and less impact of the micro environment around that seed. So if it's a little blacker, I mean, Jason mentioned about residue. Well, if there's a little residue on the soil surface over top of a seed, then that we're going to get bigger temperature differences at an inch and a half or two inches than we are at three inches. So the, we go to two or two and a half, or actually with corn now, two is a minimum. Two and a half is, is the sweet spot for a lot of growers. And what's astounding is that three inches out yielded two inches more often than two inches out yielded three inches of, as a planting depth. And, and that just is mind boggling, but it's this uniformity impact. And so right now we're in the process with winter wheat, Shane and, and I and Joanna Fallings, the cereal specialist with the ministry of trying to determine is uniformity that critical with, with another grass crop like wheat that we need to be doing that much better job with uniformity in the wheat crop, just like we are in the corn crop. So, so an astounding outcome from that standpoint. And five years ago, I would have said you're full of hot air, Lindsay. I wouldn't have believed you but the data has proved me wrong. It's really neat. Well, I, I may still be full of hot air, but um, in this instance, it's not my work, so it's fine. So Mike, I wanna sort of compare and contrast that though to the, the Western experience. Of course, often, I mean, there is grain corn out West, absolutely, but we're also looking at silage corn more, more than likely. Um, how does the recommendation differ out West? 
No, it, it's pretty similar. And I mean, I, there's a, just an absolute night and day difference between planter planted corn and, and, you know, guys that try to do it with their air, air drills out there for a lot of the reasons that we've talked about this evening. I mean, you know, air distribution, uniformity, all those kind of things. It, it's just night and day. And I, you know, I strongly encourage growers to, you know, to, uh, if they don't have a planter to get a custom planter and there is quite a few in, in Alberta, you know, get them to do that and, and get them to do it right. Honestly, you know, corn's an expensive seed to put in the ground. You know, you're trying to feed your, your beef or your dairy cattle and, uh, you know, you want as good a quality feed as you can. And uniformity is, you know, like Pete mentioned, is just so key with corn. It's just such a, a wimpy creature into row and, and within the row. I mean, and I think sometimes, you know, if it's too shallow, it just gets stranded and you get these these spaces. And it's it's just it's amazing how how a plant that can get that big at the end of the season is such a wimp coming out of the ground. And I mean, it's just it's just the way it is. And I mean. I think I think that you you know in, in areas like Eastern Canada and the U.S. where they've realized that that is the only way to plant corn, that's likely the only way to plant soybeans. I think we might you know start to look at things like canola and maybe even cereals down the road to have you know more of that planter type uh, philosophy going into the into the future because there's just no question that a planter will do a better job with a lot of different crops than a and that an air that an air drill just simply cannot. But um, you know, at the same time, we, uh, we, we plant a lot more acres per, probably per farm out here than you do in, in the east. And, uh, you know, we got to cover the ground too. And sometimes logistically, and I find logistics always trumps agronomy for, on most farms. <laughs> um, you know, we have to take that into consideration too. We got to get things done. And sometimes we got to, you know, we can't do everything perfect, right? And Mother Nature is always going to throw us a curveball when it comes to that anyway. Yeah, so the, the upside on that one, Mike, and I'll jump in here quick because I think it's really cool, is that we're starting to have technology where we can drive planters at 10 or 12 miles an hour and still do the perfect job. And and that is astounding to me, right? Uh, yeah. So so when you say you got to get the job done, absolutely. But if you can go at 12 miles an hour and uniformly seed canola at three quarters of an inch versus three miles an hour and get canola that's sort of at three quarters of an inch. Uh, I, like I re I think there's some game changing technology, even for Western Canada moving forward from that perspective, really, really fascinating. Yeah, no, I agree hundred percent. It's something that's going to have to be rethought of in a big way in the next, uh, in the next few, few years. I, I agree hundred percent. Some really cool stuff coming down the road. Mm -hmm. Now, we are also going to have some sort of face-off between canola and corn as to which one is more of a princess and or high maintenance, because it sounds like um, most of us agree that they are the two most needy of the crops um, and perhaps most uh, sensitive. So we're probably going to have to, you know, have an arm wrestle over that one. Um, but it is true. Okay, so now we are quickly running out of time. So I want to go to uh, this clip uh, with Phil Needham. So we're, we're going back into Wheat Pete's territory here, where we're all comfortable and very happy to talk about this wonderful crop of wheat. So here we go. Let's, let's hear from Phil Needham. So the primary goal of today's Cedar Clinic is to encourage producers to do a better job seeding, to encourage producers to get the right seeding depth and more consistent seeding depth across the field and across the seeding equipment. This is some research that I was involved in when I worked for the Miles organization back in Kentucky. It's a little over 10 years old now, but it shows and illustrates, I guess, some very important principles. And in this set of data, it's a replicated trial, we actually planted wheat one, two, and four inches deep, okay? In this example, it was with a double disc seeder that actually had uh, a set of conditions that had moisture at all three seeding depths. So moisture was abundant, okay? So when we planted winter wheat at a one inch deep seeding depth, we had an average yield on all reps of 103, just over. When we increased seeding depth to two inches, it dropped the yield by approximately 10 bushels per acre. When the seeding depth was increased to four inches, then it dropped the yield by about 17 bushels per acre. And what's really important, as just as important in most data sets, it's really important to know and understand what the devil in the detail is. What, what were the uh, other interactions that caused these effects? Well, we found, and all of these trials were seeded at 325 seeds per square yard, which is about 1.5 million per acre, not quite, but a rough, rough number, 306 
of the 325 that were planted emerged when the seeds were planted at one inch. When the seeding depth was increased to two inches, then 257 of the 325 that were planted emerged. When we increased the seeding depth to four inches, then 221 of the 325 that were planted emerged. So as you increase the seeding depth, then the number of plants that emerged decreased. In addition to that, what we saw, the deeper plants didn't develop as much. They didn't tiller as, lot, as much. So it actually hurts you twice. So when you see deeper, not only do you get less plants emerging, each individual plant actually develops slower. You get less tillers per plant. So it's really important to start with uniform and consistent seeding depth. So you've got uniform head populations at seeding time. So once we've established a uniform population of plants all the way across the field, ideally across different soil types and residue levels, which is a challenge for some, and that's what we've been talking about today, uh, I think one of the biggest opportunities that a lot of producers have is doing variable rate nitrogen. Uh, this is a trial that we did last year. Uh, actually using an optical crop sensing system. There's lots on the market. I'm not here to, to give the advantages and disadvantages of each, but there's a Holland system, which is obviously a very uh, similar, if not identical system to what Ag Leader offers. Hydro or Yara has one, and then there's obviously the Green Seeker. They're all uh, different approaches to a similar theme of crop sensing. And basically what we do with these sensors, we always start out with an enriched strip. That's pretty important. So we're putting a heavy, super high, perhaps 2x what you normally use or, or higher, rate of nitrogen on a field for a reference to get the field as green as possible, maximum amount of chlorophyll, and then we'll use that as a reference to calibrate the system for all other areas within the field. So we'll run a calibration strip or, or more than one calibration strips and the difference in the green strip the enriched strip and the difference in the other areas is basically what we use to calibrate it and do the variable rate work. So this is just a simple trial doing alternating strips with flat rate, variable rate, flat rate, variable rate. We're doing about three years, at least three years worth of work with these systems now. And we're finding on average yields are increased slightly, but nitrogen application rates have actually been reduced slightly. And the other benefit of these approaches, if you've got some areas of the field that are really green and your chance of lodging is increased, then we're actually putting less nitrogen over the top. So that's actually reducing lodging. If you've got areas of the field that are yellower, for example, a sandier area, perhaps there's not a lot of residual nitrogen, then we're actually putting more on those areas. So in a lot of examples, we're not using more nitrogen. Many we're actually using less, but we're just allocating the nitrogen more judiciously to get a better bang for your buck with nitrogen across the field. I just like the music. I could jam. So I really like there. It's like it's like we planned it. Um, but I do really like how Phil sort of brings together some of that discussion about not just seed survivability, but also your targeted plants per square foot, square meter, whatever you want to do. But that if if you're going way too deep or far too shallow, and you impact you know your actual viable plants, now you've set yourself up for potentially issues not just yield issues, but management issues at every step now after that, because your plant population isn't going to be where you want it to be. Yeah. So, Who so you, you got to start, you have to start with a good uniform stand. And, and that's basically what Phil was saying from a nitrogen management standpoint, but it's true with, with, timing your fungicide like your your head spray your fusarium fungicide on wheat or your white mold spray and canola your your diamondback moth spray whatever like it's all a hundred percent true and and the other thing that that absolutely i was i was pretty impressed that they got as good a stand as they did from a four inch planting depth on winter wheat like typically i sort of draw the line at three inches if i can't find moisture at three inches we would mostly say, man, you better put it at an inch and a quarter and hope it rains because the chances of it pushing up from four inches gets pretty slim. Uh, it will push up even from six inches deep, but it doesn't take much rain or much challenge before, as Mike's described, all the diseases hit you, you run out of seed treatment. And so he got a pretty good stand and a decent yield at four inches. That That's actually impressive. But if you think about what I said earlier, why is his plant count down? Well, 50 growing degree days per inch. So we're three inches deeper. 
that's additional 150 growing degree days in the fall here in Ontario. That could that could be a month. I mean, it might not be. It would depend on when, but it it could be a long time that that wheat takes to come out of the ground. And so all of that stuff plays. Plus, if it emerges later, then that, that's why it less tillers because it has less heat in the fall to build those tillers. So mm -hmm. so a whole bunch of things there that that Phil didn't really un unwrap totally in that in that thought process. But but his his bottom line is exactly correct. Yeah, and I think that you yeah, know he, he talked he talked a lot about variable rate and the opportunities that that brings to to really micromanage your farm or your fields uh, more specifically. You know, when it comes to variable rate seeding, when it comes to variable rate fertility, I I think there you know we haven't even um, started on some farms to to really harness that uh, that potential. You know, we have air, every farmer has areas in their fields that do not produce for one reason or another. It might be salinity, it might be sandy, it might be this, it might be that, but we have opportunities with the technology that we're using in the drills, um, you know, to, to vary, vary those seeding rates, to vary those nitrogen rates, to, to get that more uniform stand, and maybe even get just a little bit more survivability in those really tough areas. But in those areas that generally don't grow that much, you know, we should be probably cutting back our fertilizer quite a bit because there's generally a lot of residual in there. And then just kind of, it, it'll be more even at the end of the day and you won't get all the lodging problems and things like that, that we will see in those, you know, normal to above normal rainfall years where your, you know, your best ground, so to speak, will, you know, it's rich. And, you know, in, 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 in a lot of our areas here, we're eight to 10% organic matter. We got tremendous mineralization potential. I mean, it's, it is, it's, it's like a garden in some, in some cases mm -hmm. out here. And, uh, you know, that can, that can pump a ton of nitrogen into the system. And, and a lot of times that leads to lodging, but, you know, with the, uh, uh, the new registrations of PGRs like manipulator and modus, I'm pretty excited. I think we can really push, push our crops even more. And, um, you know, along with variable rate and along with PGRs to really, uh, you know, help, uh, help those crops stand and, and hit the highest potential that's, that's possible with what's given to us. So lots of opportunity Pete, to make Absolutely. Some and and Pete, I think, would like to borrow four to six percent organic matter if you could spare <laughs> yeah. it. You know, yeah. he doesn't want yeah. all he, of it. He would just like you to perhaps send some. Heck, yeah. if he'd even send me two percent of it, Lindsay, that would that would double <laughs> that what would a lot of Ontario happy. growers have. So it would be like oh, oh, awesome. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> this In is yeah. yeah, in southern Alberta, it, it, you know, there's lots of two to four percent organic matter in the peace country. It's you know maybe that three to six kind of thing. But here in central Alberta and a lot of the black soil zone into you know north central Saskatchewan and whatnot, it's uh, it's pretty impressive. So in some cases with our fertility programs, we gotta gotta maybe think about what Mother Nature can give to us uh, instead of forking out the dollars in every square inch of the field too. So mm -hmm. well, and so last week on the agronomist, we did talk about sort of that rate of mineralization and trying to trying to anticipate it and and adjust our management for it and it, it is what corn growers here in Ontario sort of do right I mean we have uh, the numbers that come out and that at least it's an indication right Pete yeah no absolutely we're trying to try trying to sort that out basically on a year basis and and even still it I mean it, it does come down just like Mike said, to, to areas within the field. So even when we do a, our best job on, a, on a, a provincial basis, there's still going to be variability within the field. And as an agronomist, right, as a consulting agronomist, the one thing you never want to do is short the crop on nitrogen. Because if you do that, the grower knows right away and they're never happy. And so if we could do a better job of, of measuring, you know, that, that mineralizable nitrogen by, by field zones, then I, I think, I think there's some real potential to move that bar forward. I, I really do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. All right. A couple of comments came in. I want to just as we wrap up here, uh, Jeanette says that canola is a princess, but corn is a diva. So there we go. There is a difference. We'll get into that in an, in a later episode, I suppose. Now, Farmer Jim Hale from Lancer, Saskatchewan, and new dad welcomed, uh, he and his wife welcomed a son on Saturday. So welcome here, Acre. Um, can a planter, can a planter plant that fast and put down 100 pounds of map and 40 gallons an acre of UAN? He wants to know. Yeah. Yes. And, and it's got to be able to do that. 
to do it. Yeah, that and 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 so I'll answer that. So so the, the forty gallons an acre of UAN that's nothing because we have sprayers that'll go out there and and they'll drive across the field at fifteen miles an hour and put on sixty five gallons of of twenty eight percent. So forty gallons liquid we can absolutely do that. A hundred pounds a map, yeah, we can do that. The uniformity in the trench, I mean, good grief to get those planters so that they would plant at 12 miles an hour, get every seat. It is astounding that the, the new technology is does a better job of every six inches apart for those corn seeds than my old, you know, 1980 six uh, Kinsey planter that has a finger pickup and, and still does a really good job. At, but I'm at five mile an hour. They're doing a better job at 12, but, but there's a ton of money spent to get to the point where that planter can do that. And, and we have not spent or invested in the technology to drive a planter at 12 mile an hour and put down a hundred pounds a map and know that you're getting perfect uniformity. But could we do it? Absolutely. The technology exists. It do, I, I don't doubt that for a minute. Jim, of course, I'm going to assume that this is all theoretical because of course where Jim is, it is so dry. I don't think that he's really going to put in anything more than what is it they used to do? The strip cropping where, you, you know, fallow crop, fallow crop, Jim, start that and then put a shelter belt in between. He's also the shelter belt king. So there you go. Um, I'm just kidding. I really hope it rains. I really do. They really could use yes. the moisture. So, so Lindsay, that, that is one, one of the questions that we really haven't addressed, right? So, so if you have zero moisture and, and I don't know, Mike, how deep you, you, you would suggest growers go to, I sort of draw the line at three inches. I think if there's no moisture at three inches, it gets pretty tough to go deeper than that. Uh, yeah. I know that, that no-till bill, Bill Crabtree in Australia, when they're mm -hmm. on the Western coast of Australia, super, super dry area. He will actually, he's 12 inch rows. One of the reasons he's 12 inch rows is so that he can set his cedar to anti-ridge. So he builds ridges of dry soil in between his 12 inch rows so that he can plant his wheat six or seven inches deep into moisture, but it's only two inches deep covered by soil. And <laughs> some, some years that works for him. Now I've never tried that and it, it just makes me shudder. But if, if you have no moisture, right? If you have zero moisture, my thought process is that you, you go and you seed at an inch deep basically, or an inch and a quarter if it's wheat, uh, three quarters of an inch of its canola and you buy crop insurance and you hope for rain, but you don't wait to put seed in the ground because if it ever does rain, you, you don't want to have to wait to, to get that seed in the ground and utilize that moisture. And yeah, it might not work, but I don't know. Any thought process, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I, I kind of, I, I like to, uh, you know, tend to err on the side of shallow when, when those things come about. I mean, our situation here is it's quite, uh, dry in some areas up top but the subsoil is is quite plentiful from from years past so I think you know once if we can get it going it's going to be fine that may not be the case as you get into central and southern Alberta but at the end of the day it like you said it, it still has to rain and there certainly is safeguards like crop insurance that every good farm manager uses to to help with that situation if it does uh, come to be but you know at the end of the day um, the shallower it is, if it's going to rain, it, it, it's going to pop out of the ground that much faster. Instead, I just I just hate seeing crops struggle from that three to four inch depth, depending on what we're talking about, because they just they just kind of suffer. They're kind of kind of takes the you know knocks the knocks the wind out of their sails, so to speak, and they, they mm -hmm. just kind of suffer the whole year. They're they're not as vigorous as they could be, and and that's you know as soon as that thing comes out of the ground, you know that can really dictate how it's going to behave the rest of the year, generally speaking. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I would agree. And I, and unfortunately, I think there are quite a few farmers right now, uh, you know, who are watching, watching the the forecast very, very carefully and hoping very much that some of that rain materializes. There's plenty, plenty of crop in the ground, I know. So absolutely, I think we, Pete, from what I've been hearing anyway, most are sort of going with that. There is no moisture down to three inches. So they're going to go at the more reasonable depth and, and wait for the rain at this point. So um, anyone who, who does something different, you let us know and let us know how it goes. Cause certainly I'm sure that there are those that are going to try four inches or whatever it might be. So, Hey, at least, you know, 
We we can say you're anonymous if you don't want to say what your actual name is, or just say it was your neighbor that did it. We're totally okay with that. We 100% will say it was your neighbor. Um, all right, Mike and Pete, thank you so much for joining me tonight. We are out of time. Um, it has gone so quickly. Thank you to everyone for joining us uh, in the comments for watching tonight. Uh, to Mike and to we, Pete, thanks so much for your time and your expertise. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It's always fun. Yeah, thanks. Have a great night. Appreciate it. All right. And with that, another episode of The Agronomist is done. Um, thanks so much again for joining me and my guests for uh, for this show. As always, make sure you head on over to Real Agriculture and get those CU credits. So realagriculture.com slash agronomists. Just let us know that you watch this episode so that you can get those CEU credits. And we'll see you next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on The Agronomists. Bye, everybody. Bye.